So first up is uh, Eitan and Lin. Uh, Eitan Lin, who, which will you would like to uh, present? Uh, I guess Eitan, Eitan is not here. Yeah, Eitan is not here. I guess I'm <laughs> obligated to. That made it easier. Uh, by the way, I haven't been able to move it to our Istio community drive, uh, mainly because... Um, the, the right permissions. Yeah, the permission is still not quite right for me. I, well. I'm working on reclaiming the, uh, the that account, but I have not uh, heard back from the, the Google internal tool. So I'm going to ping them again. Okay, great. Meanwhile, uh, let's see. Maybe I can actually move this over to the community drive. But uh, everybody should have comment permission. I, I think that's what's uh, most important to everybody. So, I, I mean, I changed the permission to have comment. All right, so should I go ahead and get started? I think you guys can see my screen. Yep. yep. All right. Uh, yeah, so this is a proposal uh, that's trying to, uh, I think it's a kind of a related to what John was presenting the, uh, the other week, last week, about multi-cluster. Um, so this proposal, uh, we have a requirement of uh, uh, the producer service, which is uh, also called server service, wants to expose itself as a single global host name. Uh, so, uh, using an example of my server.istio.io as a host name, and uh, today to do that, um, sorry, I'm working on sneeze, I apologize for that. Uh, today, uh, to do that, um, they typically would specify a service entry while well, they would specify uh, the host name and uh, uh, the uh, and then the post resolution and uh, using workload selector to select some of the uh, local uh, local application. Um, so what we are proposing, so this problem, uh, so still in the problem section, uh, this problem is uh, getting a little bit more complicated and many of our users would not only create a service entry to declare their global host, they would also apply uh, routes um, policy, such using virtual service in this example, uh, to combine that, apply a route policy on top of that global host, myserver.istio.io. For instance, in this example, it's applying a simple virtual service against uh, a particular prefix and, uh, and specify for that prefix on this global host is routing to a uh, subset version two of the destination. Um, yeah, so that's uh, basically how it works uh, today. So uh, what we are, um, uh, is there a hand? Sorry, it's hard to see. Yeah, just a quick question on, on this topic. Uh, do you have a VIP? Do you assign a VIP or how do you, do you Capture, how, how is capture implemented? Do you have a, I, I, I missed him when you're scrolling too fast. So, oh, you uh, so you are asking about the whips here, right? Yeah, so, so you are creating a VIP uh, manually or the user is, is just randomly? Yeah, screen. so yeah, it could be down through like auto allocation. Okay. Of and, the whip. And yes, capture is on. Uh, yeah, it was doing like as capture is on. Okay, perfect. Okay, yeah. Um, All right, so um, so the requirement is essentially how do we bring this particular same uh, function to allow producer side service to declare a global host name onto ambient, uh, where a user can still using um, similar API as today. Is there another hand? Okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry, I just clicked the wrong button. Okay. <laughs> No worries, because I can't see it. <laughs> I only heard a beep. Um, yeah. Um, 
And uh, one of the other requirements is uh, users should be able to do this for a single cluster if they choose to declare a global host name, or they should be able to do so uh, if their services span multiple cluster, they should be able to declare the same uh, global host name for multiple clusters. And uh, this should be supported regardless whether they are using isolated control play or they're using shared control plan um, so what we are this uh, what we are proposing is uh, I, I think you guys recall last week uh, Kevin uh, from our team proposed uh, Istio DNS solution, right? So we're proposing to leverage uh, the Istio DNS solution to have the Istio DNS to resolve uh, the the customer hostname, my server .io, to a whip. And uh, and then the client Z tunnel can figure out the potential next step. Um, so the potential next step could be a waypoint proxy if uh, the server has a waypoint proxy, and uh, and the way to explicitly to bind. Uh, we're proposing uh, to the way to explicitly bind a global host to a waypoint uh, can be through similar way that John has been socializing in the community on uh, layer 7 RC policy, how the layer 7 RC policy can bind to a waypoint proxy. So we, we believe it could be done similarly from an API perspective where users can just put in uh, the parent ref uh, and then refer to one or more particular waypoint uh, they want they want to bind this global host name to. Um, yeah, so that's essentially uh, what we're proposing. Uh, I think is yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, I'm, I, I mean, I, I looked, I talked with John also before, and, and I'll, I, I looked at his proposal <laughs> uh, and similar proposals. It's it's an area that I'm particularly interested in uh, it may help a lot to split this into two or three different uh, sub proposals i mean one for dns and that's already separated i believe yes we have it separated <laughs> one for the multi network or or or, or multi cluster use cases which again it's it's a very important topic and i think john has a document or two but it's yes like your general. this uh, one right yeah yeah, so uh, the, the, we can discuss them separately, but but the main thing is is in in, in your proposal and how you configure it. It's a bit different from from what I would do or I would like to see. Uh, normally, if we uh, use ambient, probably a waypoint will be required for this case, and the normal way to configure this in ambient will be you know to a gateway object using Kubernetes gateway where you can specify host name already. You can specify the the IP as well, I believe. And then in East UAD, we can relatively easily do the equivalent configuration with, with the service entry. So we don't need the verbose, you know, service entry, destination, or all the other stuff. We can derive it only from, from, from a gateway spec. And that's how gateway is supposed to work. I mean, if you spe specify example.com as a gateway, a vendor should be able to create the DNS entry, get certificates, do whatever is necessary to, to make it uh, happen. Does it make sense? Yeah, I think I understand what you were proposing. So uh, let me just re replay it back, just making sure I'm, I understand what you're saying. So basically, you're saying instead of extending our existing service entry API, in this case, user would be specify uh, a gateway resource. And uh, that gateway resource uh, would be able to declare a global host name, which today it is. and potentially that gateway resource would bind to a particular waypoint because today the gateway is not explicit i guess a gateway resource today you can specify a reference uh which the reference is typically an ingress gateway uh, but in this case could potentially bind to a waypoint proxy um, or the waypoint proxy. I mean, that's how we create waypoint proxies today so by creating a gateway resource now Yes, it is by creating a gateway resource. Um, yeah, so yeah, the, a waypoint, you specify one or more hosts with, with the existing API. So you can specify example.com, you can specify as many as you want. Everything is covered by the API. You don't need to do anything. Yeah, the, 
The only thing I'm not sure is uh, would the work of selector be covered uh, through the gateway? Uh, no, but you don't need the work of selector because because um, it's a backend ref. So that that goes to HTTP routes and backend ref because you, again you, you you have a waypoint example.com is a DNS name bound to the waypoint, but it's not necessarily one service that will respond to this. You may have slash admin going to one service. I mean that that that's a limitation in the current uh, model that you bind the host name to a single service. But with the waypoint, you bind the, the host name to the gateway and the gateway may route as necessary. Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. I guess the other concern I have though would be, would that re always require a waypoint proxy? Because in the most simple cases, you may just want the host name without necessarily have complex routing logic um so you don't necessarily need the waypoint i think what you're can't, proposing you can't do l7 without the waypoint that's one what, one one thing what if i don't have layer 7 policy i just want to use the global host how, how about we, we solve it with waypoint first because that would be the most common use case and for l7 probably you'll have other policies and we may at some point optimize it so if you don't have any other policy and you have a single Def, uh, yeah, host names definitely don't make sense for L, L, L4, but uh, it is possible to optimize it. So in some cases where there is no policy, no routing, no nothing, you can basically remove the waypoint from the from the path. We discussed it in the past. It's not impossible, but the API is still the same. And that would require for Zitana to handle L, L7. That's a long, long discussion and very controversial. Right, which is it? I know it's not intended. Um, yeah, yeah. Aitan, I think you you are here now. You were not here yes, before, sorry. so no. <laughs> Go no ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I I got I got pulled in a lot of directions. I, all I was going to say is, yeah, no. I think I think Costa and John, you're right that the the L4 only is really handled by the design discussion that we had last week around Kevin's design, and and this really is is limited specifically to when you want to apply. L7 policy to to these custom host names. Yeah. Okay. And and I think, like you said, Cost, and I agree. I I think that the the waypoint limitation is totally fine for now. Okay. So maybe uh, that's uh, I, there's a lot of agenda on today's topic. Let's uh, think about what Costin is proposing as a uh, slight different semantics uh, offline, and uh, and then we can come back to the group. Costin, would you mind um, just oh, commenting your hear? thoughts on the on the doc? No, I I, I just, just want to make sure okay. I don't forget. If you could just oh yeah, if you could just comment it on the doc, that that would be really helpful. So we have um, so we just have it written down. Yep. Sorry about it. I didn't see the doc read off. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. And let me double check permission too. But uh, one, one last comment. Uh, there is still the discussion about how we uh, verify the DNS ownership or permission to use example.com in that particular namespace. And yeah. that is tied to, I mean, it's a, it's a more generic problem than this narrow case. I mean, it may be something but, we need to do for gateways. It may be something that we can use to 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 assign Stun, DNS stands to the certificate so non your client can talk with that. So there is, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting discussion independently. And I think that also ties back to the L4 conversation as well and not limited to this because it's also about discoverability. So. OK, cool. Yeah, Kostin, you should uh, have permission to comment. Uh, please, uh, yeah, share your thoughts there. Um, but thanks for you know raising this. Uh, with that, Francis, I think we are ready to pass to the next topic. Given this like topic today. All right. Well, next one is on Yuval internal API for Zeton. Uh, yep. Hi, everybody. Um, let me see. So I have a, a PR up that uh, allows uh, adds some sort of ex internal extension points for Z tunnel, uh, allowing you to kind of customize things on the data path. And we wanted to see, we wanted to make sure, obviously Solo made sure that this proposal works with our use cases. And we want to see if there's 
other members in the community that want to take a look and make sure it, it works with their use cases. Uh, do keep in mind that this is not a user-facing API. This is more of an internal API that only vendors are expected to use. And as such, we don't need any backwards compatibility here. So I don't think we need to be kind of super strict in defining all the possible use cases because we can make back backwards incompatible changes here. Um, so yeah, just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention to get kind of consensus so we feel more confident merging this PR. And if anybody wants any questions, they can, you can either ask now or leave comments in the PR and I'll respond. I think uh, I took a quick look at it. I mean, it, it, it looks generally fine. It's pretty simple and all that. Um, I think my, my big concern is that extensibility is a big topic. Um, and, you know, I, I think we as a, as a group really aren't sure what the requirements are for it yet as, as far as like a you know what advanced capabilities we might actually want to do and whether or not this api is going to be sufficient you know and 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 if we get down the road and find that it isn't sufficient for some reason um and if we have to implement something else then we start to layer on different extension point mechanisms and it starts to become you know kind of crufty and and uh potentially problematic i i, I think for now um my so, my feeling is that like yeah it is pretty simple um and maybe for now until more teams start to you know put together their their requirements um that that maybe you guys just kind of like maintain your own fork and and kind of kind of do it there for now because because you know as, as you go forward you might actually find new requirements for for extension points as well um so so you you can grow that internally and and maybe maybe somewhere down the road we can actually put together a you know like a design doc uh for for how extension should should be done does that does that make sense uh, so my counter argument to that is what I said, I kind of see it like a, like the, if you look, if you've done Envoy development, then you'll know that the internal interface that Envoy uses for implementing filters, there's no backwards compatibility guarantee there, right? And as a vendor, it's kind of your responsibility to keep up with master. So I think this gives us the flexibility that, you know, if we do this and find out that we made a mistake, I don't think we need to be concerned of creating backwards incompatible changes, right? I don't think we need to have this code kind of be maintained in legacy format and guarantee compatibility to all backwards version because it's not a user facing API, you know? So I think the pace here can be a lot faster. Yeah, uh, I, I see, can, I mean, it's not a user facing API, but extension is a, is a big topic. And I think a lot of people will have opinions. Like I, I think, I don't think a PR is the right way to even broach this topic. I think like a RFC slash design doc where, you know, it's going to take a while to, to get consensus on, on what this sort of thing should even be. Um, but yeah, I don't think a PR is, the, is maybe the right first step. John? Uh, sorry, I thought Hoffman was standing up. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to kind of agree, like, Essentially, what we're adding here is the ability to, like, this PR doesn't benefit users, right? It benefits vendors. And we're trading off complexity of the project for simplicity on vendors, uh, which is something that's oftentimes a good trade off to make. But given that there's only, that there's multiple vendors that are interested in Ambient, and so far this only helps one vendor, it, it's not clear that this is the right time to make that trade off, right? If we're going to have an extensibility mechanism, it ought to have at least two people that are interested in it, right? It doesn't need to have everyone happy with it, but it seems premature to have an extensible ability thing with, with only one person involved. Which is, I think, to say that we are all interested in having an extensibility mechanism, uh, but maybe you want to take a little bit more time understanding our own requirements and designing it before pushing up to master. 
Yeah, I was going to say almost the same thing, uh, but with uh, with a twist, maybe. I think it's highly desirable to have an extension mechanism that prevents what we did in Istio D, where uh, and in Istio, where basically we just crammed shitload of stuff that is vendor specific and 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 uh, experiments and so forth into one binary. So I think it's super valuable to plan at some point to have an extension mechanism, but I completely agree that it needs more thinking and and definitely it needs some stronger backward compatibility because what Envoy is doing is not necessarily the best example in terms of, uh, you know, kind of making breaking changes and, and creating problems. So we should be committed to it. We should be very clear, like, like the WASM, WASM interfaces and and, uh, and all those APIs. Uh, I, I actually think the process used by WASM in a lot of those APIs is very close to what we should follow as well because you, you you if you expect multiple vendors to use it you have to have some respect for them in terms of you know not requiring them to make those changes but that doesn't mean we should not have an extension mechanism just need to spend more time uh, designing it Ethan what's your thoughts yeah so I get um, I get the the kind of impulse to try to have something that's um, more kind of formally designed. I'm also wondering if there's a way that we can cause it to happen on a like more concrete timeline. Um, and, and I'm specifically wondering like for the Aviatrix folks, um, I mean, it sounds like Solo has kind of a sense internally of what kind of extensions they want to do. Um, I, I can say Google is probably going to maintain a fork or we're, we're certainly not anywhere close to knowing what kind of extensions we want to do but i'm wondering if the aviatrix folks have a sense of um when when they'll have some resolution on that because if it's like okay aviatrix in the next month or two is going to know what kind of extensions they want to do and then maybe those are the two big vendors that might want to do extensions and and we can have you two talk and come up with a design and maybe this this patch ends up merging in two months or something like that that feels like a better situation than um kind of indefinitely pausing any extension mechanism so that's that's my question slash thought that's a very fair re response. Like, we don't want to hold things up indefinitely, certainly. Nathan, I'll let you weigh in on this too, but my gut says two months is about right. Uh, that yeah. we should be able to have a pretty concrete recommendation. I mean, the trade off, we don't have a problem creating a fork, right? The, the trade off is that if we postpone this for too long, the fork will be too divergent to be merged back. And then, you know, all the other vendors was we don't really care because we already will have the fork by then. So you know. can I ask what what feature are you trying to hook that cannot be done in my mainstream? And is it something that the customer wants, or is it some proprietary stuff that you want to add? I mean, uh, because that would be the best place point to create a hook when one of the vendors want to add a feature that is not suitable for for a main. And so, what do you plan to do with this extension, basically? we're creating some data path optimizations and you don't want to contribute them to 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 main to mainstream but you want to keep them in your fork and they can be done all with with just this extension you are not going to change anything else yeah yeah exactly yeah and there are there are some vendor integration right which may not be appropriate to contribute which you probably don't want it to, no, no, to be fair. yeah no no i completely agree that, that's the main reason I, I think it's important to have vendor extension i mean it's for both use cases but uh is it something you plan to do this before v1 uh, is released because again anything where any changes we have done in, done here it may delay it and and uh, create additional problems i mean it's yeah, I mean, either we fork it or we leverage this uh, basic extension. Yeah. Honestly, but your, I think your motivation it, yeah. makes it less compelling. It, it's one thing if someone was pitching this because they want to interact with, say, like custom Google features or something that's clearly vendor specific. But if your motivation is to optimize the data path 
which is something that everyone would benefit from, and you're keeping that in your vendor not, for not value add, and then pushing complexity to everyone else, that's not very good spirited, right? If you want to do that, yes. then not, not exactly because those optimizations can be used uh, everywhere. So it's kind of a trade off, right? We we you know it's I'm not sure that this is something that we can generally put uh, out there. Uh, but again, there's no rush. We can keep it the first and, one out. And, and and it's very legitimate. I don't think it's it's, it's not anything yeah. wrong with with a vendor doing optimizations. But but again, I highly doubt that only this hook will allow you to do optimization. You're going to fork it anyway, and I can bet that it will not be sufficient to have only this hook if you want to do real optimization. So I'm all for vendors optimizing, but some realistic, you know. Yeah. yeah. All so, right. I think in two months, Aviatrix can bring some of our preferences for extensions as well. Yuval, we're happy to work with you and find where our interests overlap and come up with an extensibility framework. Costin, you're right that this will result in either a fork or, or certainly a private repository for extensions on either of our parts. But uh, even in the case of a fork, having those hook, hook points be somewhat more stable uh, more predictable and designed for that interaction should mean that the cost of maintaining those forks is reduced with John to your point We would intend minimal complexity for other users as a result Sounds like a good plan to me All right, perfect All right, we'll circle back on this topic in two months. Um, Mitch, I think you are next, is yep. that right? Yes. If you have a proposal. Mitch, do you want to present? Uh... Sure, I can do that. Let me open this up. Scoot over there. Sorry, I should have been better prepared. This is almost done getting shared. Okay. Can you all see the uh, API proposal doc here? All right. So uh, the background on this, uh, about a month ago, we had some conversations around how Waypoint upgrades would happen and when we would decide to upgrade in a waypoint. And the decision at the time was to use something very consistent and similar to what we have in sidecar mode. That is that tags and revisions will control uh, what version of the waypoint is running. The same way that tags and revisions control what version of the sidecar is running, with the exception, of course, that a waypoint is an actual deployment. So there's a little life cycle differences there, but overall, Something very consistent look and feel, upgrading from one to the other should be very consistent. We've got that partially implemented today uh, in the ambient branch. Uh, in particular, what was implemented so far has been that um, it didn't used to be the waypoints upgraded at all. You could upgrade an Istio control plane, and it would just see that the waypoints exist and leave them be. Now it will upgrade them to the new version. If you make any changes to the waypoint template, those will automatically be pushed out. So that, that's looking pretty good. We need a little bit, there's a little bit left to do that I've not taken on right away in terms of tags and revisions. And I'll get into why here. So tags and revisions are a concept from Sidecar Model by which each of our control plane versions has a unique name called a revision. And each workload through either namespace labels or workload labels is going to opt into a revision or a tag. A tag is just, think a symlink to a revision. It's an alias, um, which makes things a little bit easier. Let's say you have revisions 1.2 and 1.3. You might have tags first wave, second wave, third wave, fourth wave. You are going to adjust those tags one at a time to point to from revision 1.2, now up to version 1.3, which will cause things to upgrade. Uh, the relationship of revisions and tag is represented here. And, it, and this DoD has a revision. Today, a tag is actually ephemeral. 
There is no tag resource in Istio. You can't cube cuddle get tags. We have an Istio control command for creating, listing, and updating tags. Um, but what it actually creates in the cluster is a mutating webhook. And the reason for this is that mutating webhooks are how we create sidecars today. Uh, so it was a very natural way to represent both tags and revisions in sidecar mode. As we imagine moving forward to ambient mode, mutating webhooks will no longer be required. Uh, so for a transitionary period where a user has sidecars and waypoints, they'll be required. But as soon as the user no longer wants to use sidecars, or if we have a greenfield installation, which strictly uses uh, waypoints, there will be no reason to have no technical reason to have this mutating webhook config in the cluster. As a matter of fact, it represents something of a security concern for a lot of our users. And we would actually need to be running the server side of the webhook within Istio D in order to not break stuff. It would do nothing, um, but still, that's extra resources. So ideally, we would like to not have this mutating webhook config as soon as sidecar mode is disabled. Uh, additionally, if you're using GitOps, uh, which is you know, something that we want our users to do more and more, uh, looking at your Git repo, it's very difficult to see what tags or revisions exist. They exist as mutating webhook config objects, which are quite large. I've actually got an example down here. This is one of our mutating webhook configurations that you might actually that the secret part wouldn't be stored in Git, but um, it's huge. And this is just one. This represents, I believe, one tag. I'd have to go and check. Uh, what are we representing here? Yes, the default tag. Um, this is really unwieldy to edit. If I wanted to say take this tag, which is pointing at a certain revision and point it at another revision, it's not clear how I would do that. The, the truth is you can use the Istio control command to do that, but that's not necessarily super compatible with our GitOps mode of operation. We'd like to be able to just go and edit this file to modify it. To that end, my proposal uh, is that we create a tag CRD. Uh, the tag CRD has three fields, name, revision, and auto namespace. The naming of this last field probably could use a little bit of improvement. Uh, and that in sidecar mode, when we have these tags, we use it to create mutating webhook configs on the fly. When we are not using sidecar mode, those mutating webhook configs would not be created. But the, the upside is that in either mode, in order to change what revision a given pod is a member of, you can update the tag object, and that will get executed, whether it's for waypoints or for sidecars. I'll give John has raised security concerns about this proposal. In particular, today, um, users can create the mutating webhook config using Helm rather than allowing Istio D to do so. That's not the default behavior. By default, Istio D has the permission to create mutating webhook configs. But some of our more security conscious users are uncomfortable with that. So they disable that and create the mutating webhook configs by hand. So my proposal is that we carry that mode forward, allowing users who don't want to use this tag API but instead want to handcraft webhook configs to still do so moving forward for like a high security sidecar mode all other modes would automat or would allow use of the tag API. Costin, I see you've got a question. Yeah, well, first of all, all this discussion about mutating webhook probably should be moved to the previous meeting because it impacts sidecars, not ambient. Ambient is not necessarily concerned with uh, mutating webhooks. And I assume that the goal for ambient is to not have any mutating webhook. Yep. Uh, the main concern, I mean, remember the whole revision proposal was not necessarily original. It was based on what Knative is doing and what Istio itself is doing for version and traffic shifting. And it was done because Istio D is kind of the control plane and it, it was the most convenient and easiest way to do it, but not necessarily the best because we already have APIs exposed to do traffic shifting at HTTP route. And, and uh, so we could achieve almost the same result using the existing APIs and putting a gateway in front of Istio D, which is also used for other purposes. So I would not add more, you know, duct tape on top of duct tape on top of duct tape for, for what we did with the original revision. When with ambient, we are trying to clean up things and, and move back to, to first principle and to kind of to, 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 to simplify things. 
Uh, I know I had some, you don't disagree with me about having a gateway in front of EastUOD and we had some discussion in the past, but maybe it's a point to, to, to you know, kind of reopen it, John. Yeah, I think, I mean, regardless of whether I agree or not, <laughs> Uh, back in the day, revision really meant what you connected with XDS, but now it means a bit more, right? Um, like we have a specific revision actually going and writing deployments for the waypoints. So just having a gateway doesn't solve that problem because it's the opposite direction of communication. East DoD is deciding whether it should take some action in the cluster. Now, it could go and read those HTTP routes and kind of reverse it instead of reading this tag potentially, but it's not just as simple as it used to be where um, you know you just have to control traffic to East 2D. Uh, apologies. Yeah, that's true. Said, sidecar mode as well as ambient mode. Uh, sidecar, let's not discuss sidecars, but uh, I, I, maybe I misunderstood uh, this. Uh, the gateway would be for Z-Tunnel itself and for, for uh, proxyless and other use cases. I mean, the waypoints are clearly managed by East 2D, East 2D who is Winning the election will definitely be able to do whatever it was. We don't need an extra API for that. I mean, whatever rollout for EastUD is done, it's in the point of Right, but if I if I have two tags A and B, and then I have two gateways, and one says I want to use revision A, and one says I want to use revision B, we need to have the correct one be actuated by the correct EastUD. Otherwise, we'll have the wrong version, right? But we have gateway class, we have first class APIs for that. We don't need to invent a new CRD for this. I mean, gateway class is exactly, I mean, since a waypoint is instantiated by a gateway, the gateway class is the ones that would control it. No? So gateway class specifies that this is an Istio ambient gateway or a waypoint. Uh, it does not specify which version of Istio that is present in the cluster will control the, that particular waypoint. Why not? And that, that's what we're trying to solve here. I mean, why not? I mean, it's a, it's a CRD that, that, you know, it's you can specify any name you want, Istio slash v1 or Istio slash red door. So one, one particular reason not to do that is that it creates unstable gateway class names, which, as I understand it from the Gamma folks, is an anti-pattern. Uh, another reason is that you would need to go and change the name, the gateway class, on every gateway that you own in order to perform an upgrade, which is not what we want to do here. That's the whole purpose of tags. You don't necessarily need different gateway names, right? It could be the same class name, but I have revision maybe as a configurable field in the resource. Yeah, annotation, yeah. That's exactly this proposal. It has rev it'll have a label uh, just as existing workloads do. No, but you put the labels in, in gateway class. Yes, yeah, so I think the challenge, there is a need for this. Now the challenge is, do we need its own customer resource for this, or could this be merged into some of our existing resource? Right, that's what the uh, Kostin was mentioning. What about the gateway resource? Can it add the revision? You know, so you don't have to have a dedicated uh, customer resource for tech. So the, the if as I understand it, Costin, the proposal is that a gateway class be a member of a revision. Yeah, I believe uh, it. All of the gateways that use that class get that revision. You can then change what revision a gateway class is participating in, which affects an upgrade across all of the, the gateways participating in that class. Kind of, I would be a bit more more flexible in that. I mean, maybe a preferred version because in reality, if you have if you upgrade to you have to D one for fifteen and they move to one seventeen, and you remove one fifteen, you want uh, you know one seventeen to actually take over all the implementations of all waypoints because again nobody else will be able to handle the the other ones. So there is some logic that we need to have in to D to be able to, you know, yes, you have a preference for for the old uh, version, but when you upgrade to D. Once you remove all these TODs, a new one needs to take over. So there is a mix of, of, you know, how do you control where it goes and how do you control who instantiate and, and, and upgrades the, the TOD and how, how do you do this upgrade? It's not simply, hey, I want to use a revision 114 and if 114 is gone, sorry, I'm going to crash, burn and uh, cause an outage. Okay, so it sounds it, like what I'm it doesn't have to be as imperative as it was with with Istio. So with with Istio, you said the webhook is a URL. The URL is gone. You're 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 uh, out of luck. Right. So I, I guess my concern, Costin, is it sounds like you're wanting to reopen the discussion of how to affect upgrades, which we already spent a month on. Um, 
Are there, are there enough voices that are worried about that pattern that don't want to continue the tag and revision pattern that we should revisit that design or? I, I'm not saying we, sh we it's, it's a bad design. It's a very good design. That's what we have done. It's, it's, it's what we recommend to our user to do for their own application. I'm saying that we need to be a bit more flexible and less strict about uh, and not repeat the mistakes we did with the, with the webhook and with the fixed URL. So Istio D should have some flexibility to take over a waypoint and, and win the election and do code-wise uh, management instead of being very strict with the labels. Yeah, I like the idea of the flexibility. Particularly, it would make sense to me that if auto namespace is enabled, the default tag then takes over. In, in case you specify a revision or tag that doesn't exist, you fall back to the default. Um, that being said, we can still very much do that with this existing tag proposal. Uh, and we can do that with sidecars as well. There, there's We can have that be consistent across ambient and sidecar mode in Istio without too much difficulty. Um, does that make sense? The, the, the thing that I'm a little bit more concerned about is the idea of having multiple gateway classes where those classes have a revision rather than the individual waypoints themselves. That would be a pretty big departure from what we've done so far. OK, you're, you're suggesting we don't. Uh, the, the, yeah, we'd have to discuss the sidecar side of it. I mean, those are going to be around for quite a long time. And we do expect users to need to have smooth transitions uh, where both sidecars and ambient live side by side for an extended period of time. So some degree of consistency will be required. But we can debate exactly what degree of consistency that is. Yeah, let's focus on the migration of sidecars to ambient and not of sidecars, uh, current webhooks to tags and other things. I mean, let's keep sidecar as stable as possible and try to migrate as many as many <laughs> users as possible to ambient instead of uh, touching and right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe I've been unclear. That's a, that's what this proposal is intending to do. Uh, we need a way to represent tags for waypoints that is not mutating webhooks. Ambient should not have mutating webhooks by default. Uh, so this proposal is that we create a tag CRD so that we can continue using that same logic of tags and revisions without needing to rely on webhooks for ambient. So, uh, so given the time, maybe, Kostin, you and a couple of other people, we should review offline, because I think only John reviewed the proposal. And then maybe, Mitch, you want to bring back to the work group meeting next week as well to cover the sidecar perspective. And then we can rediscuss this again on the ambient meeting to focus on this ambient portion. OK. Would that work for you too, Kostin? Uh, yeah, and, and I think John has an open PR to, to make some changes to remove the webhook injection. I was just reviewing it. So after he merges it, the reality will be slightly different. Uh, yeah, just to be clear, uh, the web the waypoint code was modeled based on this proposal, and now my PR is moving the normal ingress gateways to follow that same waypoint code. So it is aligned with the proposal, um, not in, but opposing it. But, but okay, it, that's that's it, it, it also it also removes injection from the ingress gateways. As I as I see it right now, it doesn't yet, John, respect tag and revision, I think, if I've read it correctly. Is that right? Uh, that's probably true. Yeah. yeah so I think this so. would, ultimately, we need some concept of tag and revision to carry forward into ambient mode. And that's what this design is, is for. We haven't done it yet. OK. Yeah, yeah no, it moves us in the right direction. The CRD. My question was with the CRD itself, not, not necessarily about having tag and revision, but with the expression it with a new Istio CRD. I'm not against adding the CRDs, but not for this particular case. So what, what I would love to see, Costin, is, is what the alternative looks like. Because today it's represented as a mutating webhook, and I think you and I both agree that it shouldn't be represented as a mutating webhook in ambient. It needs some representation, so we should talk about what that looks like. OK. OK, great. Yeah, good discussion. Uh, we still have one more topic I'd like to move to next. Uh, ben, I think you are here. Yeah, uh, and there's been some comment on this. 
Uh, should I go ahead and share it? Or we'll talk through it. Yeah, it's the ambient CNI approach. I'll go ahead and share that, I guess. Uh, right. So this is kind of you know based off of the the proposed PR, I think, Intel has out to add eBPF-based redirection to ambient. Um, that makes sense. I guess the thing that this is trying to talk about is to kind of discuss the approach for how we integrate that with the existing CNI plugin we have um, to make sure that we're thinking about the implications of that. Um, the current approach, I believe, bakes the eBPF progs, which are kernel space C programs, into the CNI binary, right? So the, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, or the, the way it works now, right? We've got a CNI binary, we've got a CNI daemon set, which copies binaries to the node. And then those binaries, you know, are uh, hooked into the CNI interface and actually respond to container D events and actually mutate the underlying networking stack accordingly, right? So right now that CNI plugin just does IP tables, right? It does IP tables based redirection for both ambient and sidecar. Um, if we add eBPF to the mix, it might do a third thing, which is eBPF only for ambient, uh, I believe is the current constraint. I don't think we're intending to support eBPF for sidecars right now. Um, it's an entirely, so essentially it's an entirely parallel form of like uh, node level networking stack manipulation that exists in the same CNI plugin. Um, and so while that might make sense to some degree, I think there's some concerns we have around baking the actual kernel space program code into that binary, uh, which also has IP tables. Basically, right, you've got two parallel networking stacks. One of those networking stacks has now has kernel space code baked into the same binary. Um, and changing that becomes impossible without, you know, patching the entire CNI plugin, uh, potentially messing with the IP table stuff or whatever else, right? You can't just change the progs themselves, the kernel space stuff. If you have to rev the kernel space stuff, we want to replace them, uh, you, want, you know, whatever else you want to do there, that starts to affect the whole CNI binary, even if you don't care about EDPF because you're not using ambient or you don't care about EDPF because you're using IP tables or whatever. It's all bound together in one binary and becomes kind of cut a couple in that way. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk through is like maybe we do something different there such that at least the kernel space progs are, you know, not packaged in the CNI binary in a way that you can't change them without shipping a whole new CNI binary, which would include IP tables, ambient and non-ambient CNI. Um, that's kind of what we're talking through here. There's a couple of approaches, right? Like realistically, like I think the original intent was to avoid creating an entirely separate CNI plugin, right? Like that would be the really, really formal way to do it, right? You have one Istio CNI plugin for IP tables and you have one for eBPF and they're chained using the CNI plugin infrastructure. Um, that becomes kind of a burden to maintain, right? Because then you've got two CNI plugins and maybe if you don't care about eBPF, you don't need to install the second one. But if you do need to support both, scenarios, you have to install both and they can't interact in weird ways. And we have to maintain that upstream. That sucks. That seems like it sucks to me. Um, the other option is, you know, the singular CNI plugin, um, which right now, like I said, it bakes the eBPF progs into the binary, um, which is a little problematic from our perspective because then suddenly the CNI plugin has like, you know, the, the, it, it's bound by kernel version constraints, right? Those kernel side progs are tied to specific kernel versions, right? So if I want to say use a specific kernel API, I have changed the prog. That won't change anything about the CNI plugin. It won't change how the CNI plugin interacts with the eBPS stuff in kernel space, but I can't swap out the progs without changing, you know, without replacing, without essentially patching or maintaining patching against the whole CNI plugin. And the CNI plugin starts to inherit like kernel version constraints that are only applicable to the eBPS side of things. But since it, the eBPF and IP tables are all shared in the same plugin, it gets to be a little messy. Um, or conceptually could get a little messy. So that's kind of why we want to talk through. Maybe the prog specifically need to be separate. And that's enough. Front matter, okay, yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, my concern is it just doesn't seem like any of the reasons to split it are compelling and they add cost to split it. Um, you know, okay, if like there's different kernel versions we need to test, that's fine. It's just as easy to make two plugins as it is to make two BPF programs. Or one plugin that has a if statement in the BPF program. Um, you know, it, it just 
there's a reason that we have a monolith in Istio D, right? It's because mm -hmm. while there's some small benefits of microservices and ultimately in a product like Istio, it just adds complexity. It's, it's pretty standard practice to embed BPF programs in the thing that's installing them. It, it just doesn't, I don't see any real benefits of, of this yeah. massive decoupling. And I'm not saying I'm not saying that we wouldn't have a program that's installed on the BPF proc. I'm saying that the CNI plugin itself would just run the installer program, as opposed to it also being the installer program and also having all of it tied together with thing, which is a little weird, I grant you, but it makes yeah, it easier. Yeah, but now, to swap like, if we out. do that, we have an installer daemon set which installs a binary on the right. node, and yeah. then something invokes that binary, and then now yeah. you're saying that invokes another binary, it's which a weird invokes meta plugin BPF thing. thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, why not yeah. just cut a few middlemen and just have it invoke? In, you know yeah I, I like that's the main concern is like maybe the license like you said is not a concern because the kernel space stuff is dual has to be dual bsd or gpl or gpl B bsd is compatible with apache too so i think we're okay baking that into the cni plugin which is apache um generally speaking but yeah but again it makes it difficult to tweak or replace those progs without patching or maintaining patches or forking the whole cni plugin just to main, just to change kernel side stuff, which the CNI plugin doesn't strictly care about, right? All the CNI plugin really needs to do is attach some progs to fix hooks. That's it. It doesn't care about how the progs are implemented for C programs, right? And right now, those C programs are baked into the CNI binary in a way that means you can't change them without changing the CNI binary, which is a yeah, little difficult if you want to Changing the CNI that. binary is just as easy as changing the programs. I know, but like, there's no actual reason why the CNI binary should need to change for that since it is not coupled, right? There's no coupling there, and we're, we 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 can create coupling because it's easier to distribute. But like, again, like if I want to, you know, if if I want to support something in a kernel version that's not what the CNI plugin supports, like, yeah, know, I mean, I'll, we could do the same. Like, Easter Cuddle could be 100 binaries for each subcommand instead of one big binary, but. Uh, sure, but I mean, I think the difference here, though, is that we're actually talking about kernel space progs, which have a dependency on kernel space APIs, which is not something that's true of any other part of Istio. And so, like, that's kind of why I'm raising this, right? There's a there's there's tertiary concerns here that are not true of other parts. So I agree that like we don't have that constraint elsewhere, but here we do, right? Where we're actually loading things into the kernel that depend on specific kernel versions having specific APIs in place, and that's unique so far for us. Even the IP tables uh, approach doesn't have that constraint. It's like kernel modules, right? In a way. So, like, that's a concern for us. We would, you know, we, we would like to be able to change that without having to, uh, you know, do the whole. We would like to be able to easily swap those things out without necessarily having the whole CNI plugin inherit those constraints or be tied to those things or have, you know, knock on effects from kernel versions or whatever. Anyway, that that's the thing. Uh, comment on it. Um, we don't have to come to a decision right now, but like that's kind of where we're at with it. And again, Lynn, from yeah, Holland, we have right? two, we have two hands, so I'm going to make sure we get through them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, go ahead. Stop talking. Yeah. Yeah. So from my point of view, so firstly, um, the current eBPF, the, the kernel version requirement is really low. So it means um, you, your concern you just mentioned um, from my point of view is not a problem because we, we are not using very new kernel BPF helper function here. So uh, this is one point. Uh, the other part is, you know, actually currently the CI code, uh, we pick in the uh, uh, CBPM pro program here, but uh, it actually has a clear separation here. So user can use flag to control whether they, they want to use the IP tables or EBP, EBPM. So I don't think it's a mix uh, and, and a messy here. So that's well, my right. they, they can They can pick IP tables or EBPF, but they can't use different EBPF prods or even modify the EBPF prods without essentially you know, doing their own uh, fork or patch version of the CNI plugin. Even if they don't care about the IP table side, right? They can't change the EBPF side without shipping all new thing or doing the whole new thing and as far as the kernel versions right like again like yeah like in your pr you're using uh some you're using some kernel apis that allow us to have that lower bound of the 420 or whatever which you know we may or may not want to support because that's not lts but whatever um but we can't but like if we wanted to use some of the faster kernel apis uh in our ebpf progs then that suddenly affects how we test that whole CNI plugin, even if it doesn't change anything about how the CNI plugin interacts with EBPF or what what it's doing, right? It doesn't matter, right? That's an implementation <laughs> detail of the product itself. We can't change that without changing 
you know, the actual whole CNI plugin, which maybe you don't even like, you know, has IP tables, is doing other things, and maybe you aren't even using that, but it's all bound together. So it kind of becomes something you have to be concerned about, right? Like now, if the yeah. CNI plugin has a kernel version support uh, itself, right, that we have to deal with. Yeah, but but the problem here is, you know, um, if you, um, for example, upgrade your EBPM program to a newer version, if even if you split it out, it means you need to test the your split outed version here, right? But yeah. if if you, I mean, if we bake it into the CI binary, but if if you doesn't touch it, I, I mean, uh, you doesn't touch the EBPM part because there are already a flag here to, to control you to switch one option to the other. So it, it means if you do not uh, upgrade EBPF or you don't have the need, then you don't need to, ch to, to touch the CNI binary. So it's not a problem. I mean, if even if you split out, it does not solve the kernel, you know, if you uh, upgrade your uh, BPI, EBPF program to the newer um, BPI helper, it, it also need your work to, you know, build your new stability the version binary. Right, so it, it doesn't solve the problem. Right. You but, mentioned. But if you split out the EBPF frogs and their installer into that binary, then you're just testing that EBPF installer binary against different kernels. You don't have to test the whole CNI plugin, right? And it's easier to replace just or, or, or twiddle the progs in that plugin, right? Without shipping your own forked CNI, Istio CNI plugin, uh, or whatever else, right? So, like, that's the other question is like, if, if you want to change the progs, how do you do that? Well, they're baked into the CNI plugin, so you have to essentially patch or fork the whole CNI plugin. Yeah, and right, John, that is that is one of the options is ship your own CNI plugin. Um, but that that just shipping your own CNI plugin just because you want to change one of the progs in a way that doesn't affect the CNI plugin seems kind of gross. But I also again like that could be a stance of right that we don't care ship your own CNI plugin you know go away like that is that's valid like I think that's fine but like that's kind of why I propose this because I think there's a middle ground here of maybe we just don't bake those kernel side those kernel those kernel space programs into the CNI plugin we don't have this problem right uh, if you wanted to go really crazy and like you know actually completely rework it sure ship your own CNI plugin but just to change procs that don't affect anything about the user space CNI plugin you have to build your own Oh, now you already have to build your own Docker image to embed the programs, anyways. Uh, no, you, you don't. I don't think you have. I mean, well, where are you putting the programs? I mean, yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, you well, could. You could, but you'd have to ship your. You know, again, you'd have to. You could. You could just be replacing the binary that installs the progs, as opposed to patching and shipping your whole list of CMC and I plugin in parallel. Uh, okay. That would I mean, I, I get your just, point, but to me, it, the argument that we're going to replace one binary instead of a different binary is not yeah. compelling at all. Um, yeah. I mean, that, yeah, I, I understand that. I, I guess, like, again, like, this is, again, sort of new and unique in that we are now shipping things below the kernel space, which we were not doing before. And that is a little different and I think kind of argues against the monolithic approach that otherwise makes sense. Um, Let me just throw in there. I haven't... Um read the doc yet, so this might be in there, but um, I, I think some specific examples of a situation, like what the before and after of this yeah. feature was implemented yeah, that's right. would help. Like I, I I, could imagine it actually being useful, but I, 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 think, I think we're kind of jumping to conclusions about, I'm, I think I'm jumping to conclusions about how how this would impact the UX that aren't particularly compelling, but I think you have ideas that are more compelling than the ones in my head. So um, helping with that would, would help, I think, move this forward. Yeah, that's right. So a uh, quick time check. It's three minutes after, and we still have one more talk yet on here. Yeah, I'll be one minute. I just want to give an update on what's happened in the past two or, I don't know, however many weeks. Um, so there was a big change from Quat um, recently that fixed a bunch of issues and kind of refactored the XDS based on all the discussion we had the previous few weeks about how policies attach. Um, it's still not 100% done, but this morning we got most of the policies back in for, uh, for a while, uh, like OTC policy and whatnot. What's it working? So the current state's pretty good. Um, we're still working on finalizing like using the actual APIs we agreed upon. Um, the other thing is that we're starting the upstreaming process. Um, so if you see PRs um, related to upstreaming, or any PRs, really, uh, please review them so that we don't end up with 
like three different forks that we try and keep in sync. You know, the faster these things get converged, uh, the better for everyone. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, anything else, folks? All right, and if not, let's call conclusion for today's meeting. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.